We're on the Lazen channel now, baby. Woo! Quick disclaimer before we get started. I'm in no way qualified to claim I am reviewing Malazan. I'm just a dude taking this trip for the first time. So think of this as more of a fun video portraying my thoughts on Malazan as I take the trip. If, however, you are interested in seeing the emotions that I go through and the things that I discover along my Malazan journey, then, well, stick around. So when picking up Malazan, a lot of people start here with the very, very first book. I, however, did not. And I know, I know you're thinking, you didn't start with the first book, what are you, like, are you crazy? And the answer to that is, yes, I, instead, started with Ian C. Esselmont's Night of Knives, which takes place in between the prologue and chapter one of Gardens of the Moon. Are you confused yet? Because I sure as hell was. So because I read this first, I'm just gonna go ahead and talk about this first. Starting with the plot. Knight of Knives is by no means a great book. I'd argue that it's probably not even a good book. Knight of Knives is very straightforward. It takes place all in one night, all on one island, and basically this night happens and it's the night of the shadow moon and things are changing and there's a play for power. And we basically get into the minds of two characters, Temper and Kiska. I'll talk about them later, but they're basically thrown into events that have, you know, much larger ramifications. And you can tell that these events have larger ramifications in the larger universe of Malazan. But Ian C. Esamont doesn't really delve into what's happening and why it matters. He gives you the events and you catalog them in your brain and you take them with you. Eventually, you do find out what's happened in this book, which is why some people might argue that it's better read later, after you've read the series, because you'll enjoy this book a little more. I can't rightly recommend Knight of Knives to anyone because it is pretty poorly written. Some things just don't work. Uh, it's... <laughs> I don't know. It's just the way it's written is kind of clunky and... It feels like a first book, and I do believe that this was Esselmont's first book he wrote, so... I give the guy credit. I'm, I've heard he gets better over here, so I'm gonna stick with him. But for Knight of Knives, my general consensus is that you could take or leave it. It really doesn't matter. Comparatively, Esselmont's style of writing is lesser than Erickson's, and a lot of fans agree that that is, you know, kind of how it breaks down. Esselmont writes in this um, simpler way. He doesn't pack as much information into his paragraphs that Erickson does. Okay, so the plot of Knight of Knives is relatively simple, especially when you start comparing it to that of the main Malazan books. But the characters are even simpler. <laughs> Kiska, I, I couldn't care less about Kiska. Kiska? K Kiska. I'm saying it Kiska. There might be a lot that I mispronounce in here. But hey, this is Malazan. Everyone pronounces it Malazan. Okay, at least I got that right. Kiska, I, like, I, she's forgettable. I, I, I've already met so many other characters in the main series that bury Kiska as just this unfor unknown, forgotten, goodbye Kiska. Temper, on the other hand, was kind of, um, kind of interesting in ways. Uh, I still don't truly care a whole lot about Temper, but I'm not saying that they're, these are bad characters, that they're poorly written. They're just very, very shallow, and you can't see yourself getting lost in a story if it was being told from these two points of view. Luckily, Knight of Knives is pretty short, so you're not with these characters for very long. There is a saving grace when it comes to characters, though, and that's you get a taste for some of the major players in the main Malazan series, which I enjoyed that. Anytime we were seeing someone that eventually I read more of in Gardens of the Moon, 
those were the moments I looked back on and was like, hmm, okay, I'm getting a nice little rich backstory from Night of Knives. I'm pulling from this book things that I know about these people. Granted, it's not much. You don't learn a whole lot about Tatrin or Empress Lacine or some of the other more spoilery things. But you get a you get a little you get like a little taste, and that's enough. And I came to value Knight of Knives because when you're thrown into Gardens of the Moon, things are happening very quick, and there's not a whole lot of time to spend on trying to figure out who's who. And having a little bit of backstory to pull from, from Knight of Knives, uh, I found it a little easier. So yeah, you get like little, little nibbles, little tastes of these other large major players, which is really nice. And you also get tastes of what the world's about. But mostly, you get a taste of what you're in for when you get to Gardens of the Moon. If I had to take a stab at summarizing this book, I would say that it is about a ongoing war and the forces that want to lay claim to the city of Darugistan and bridge burners. Can't forget the bridge burners. It's, it's also, actually, scratch everything I said. It's about the bridge burners. That's all it's about. <laughs> the fact of the matter is you can't properly summarize Gardens of the Moon. And that's because there's just so much happening at any given time in this book. There's not one plot being built here. There's multiple plots being built here. There's multiple things being set up. This book is more of like just one big prologue to multiple different things. A lot of people say Gardens of the Moon is a hard book to read. I would agree with them. However, I found it very easy. Malazan fans are pointing guns at me right now because they're like, who is this man? He found Gardens of the Moon easy? That's for, that's absurd. But I assure you, I found this book pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Of course, I'm not claiming I understood every little thing that was happening. No, 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 no. There were many things that just went whoop, right over my head. So with Gardens of the Moon, you were thrown into the middle of a story, pretty much. Right around the climax area of one. And it's up to you to do your own work, to figure out what's happening, to pay attention. Um, so much so that I couldn't even read this book when I was tired or when I was a little bit distracted because I would miss things and have to reread chapters. And that's a large contributor to why I think a lot of people pick this book up and put it back down is because it's hard work. It, and it feels like hard work. It's not just people say, oh, that series is hard work. And you pick it up as like, oh, what? Because it has like big words in it that's hard work? No, it's, it is so hard. It's like you're reading a history textbook at times because there's so much to catch up on. Erickson is really good at giving you a large cast and then juggling them. And it never felt forced. Like each character has a certain place within the plot and they have this thing that they contribute to the plot that pushes the plot forward. These characters aren't here for fluff. They aren't here to just fill time. They feel needed, and they also feel like real people. And that in itself is such a large feat because there's a lot of people in this book. A lot of people say that Erickson isn't good at characterization, so much so that it led to a Facebook post a while back. And it was this whole big thing. I don't think he's bad at characterization, but Gardens of the Moon definitely isn't the best of his ability. It's not the best showcase of how he deals with characters and how he formulates them. What I think Erickson is good at is he gives you a blank slate, a character that he builds in a very certain way but doesn't force the reader to look at them in a certain way. You develop your own feelings, and I feel like that's why the Malazan community has such wildly different opinions on certain characters, is that we all look at them different. This world is so, so, so rich. The lore is deep. There's history that you don't even know. The races feel so diverse and different from anything I've seen. The magic systems are hard to figure out, but so intriguing and I just want to learn so much more about them and 
all of this comes together in this beautiful little package that Erickson kind of hands to you and you go, thanks, but I don't get it. And hey, I knew there were going to be things I didn't understand going into Malazan, but at times it's still discouraging because how am I supposed to enjoy what I'm reading if I don't fully understand what I'm reading, right? And this is where we come to my favorite part of my Malazan experience thus far. It's the moments when you figure things out. It's the moments when Erickson pulls back the curtain and says, here, this is what I was building the whole time. You know, they say when critiquing something, avoid objective or outwardly bold claims. Since we've already established that this is not a critique or a review and more of my Malazan experience, I can say with the utmost certainty, I have never read anything like Malazan. And I'm almost certain that when I'm finished Malazan, I will never ever read anything like it again. I have no idea how long this video is going to be, but I have a feeling it might be one of my longer ones. So if you've stuck around this long, then thank you for watching. If you've read Malazan, or the two books that I talked about in this video, let me know what you thought in the comments down below. Maybe leave a thumbs up, and consider subscribing if you like what I do here. But other than that, well, I will catch you on the flip side, book bros.